Well, good morning. We are continuing in our series entitled Trust. We've been exploring where it is that we place our trust. Do we put our trust in the things of the earth, in the things that we can control, money, 401ks, investments, real estate? Some of you might think those are not really under your control. <laughs> or do we put our trust in the things of the kingdom of heaven? The question that we're really asking is, do you trust God? Do you trust him to have your best interests at heart? Trust is defined as assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. Let's call that trustworthiness. Another definition is dependence upon something future or contingent. Let's call that hope. So trust in someone then involves, if we think them as trustworthy, and hope that they will do what they say that they will do. We've been studying our way through the Sermon on the Mount, haven't we? And we've been seeing very clearly that Jesus is preparing his disciples to be become citizens of a new kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. He's calling us to a new way of life, a new community. And he's been teaching us that the thing that's getting in the way of that community, of fully giving ourselves over to it, is our heart. We can have a heart attitude that is incongruent to living in this new community. We can have hearts that are legalistic, thinking that as long as we don't murder somebody, then we're good. As long as we don't act on our lustful thoughts, we're being faithful in marriage. And as long as we go to church on Sunday and drop some cash in the plate as it goes by, then we can pursue greed in other areas of our lives. But as I said, this is the wrong heart attitude. It's incongruent to the community that Jesus is calling us to, that he is building. Jesus is turning all of those notions upside down in our lives. And he's bringing us to a new understanding where the old ways of our hearts are being replaced with the hunger and thirst for righteousness that he described in Matthew chapter 5. And in this new community, we do more than just refrain from killing our neighbor who slighted us in some way. Jesus calls us to be careful not to call each other fools or to curse them or to even think poorly about them. For everyone is made in the image of God. We must have the right attitude in our hearts in this totally countercultural community that he's called us to. We must mean what we say and do what we say. This is what Jesus says about that. He says, again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath on your own head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And then he says this, let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. In other words, you shouldn't need to qualify your answer to a commitment with some kind of an oath. Just be men and women who actually do what you say you're going to do. Be people of honesty and integrity. And so then in the middle of chapter 6, after Jesus spends some time teaching his disciples how to pray, which is the vehicle of communication and how that's going to be handled here in this community called the kingdom of heaven, he turns his attention to the topic of where we put our trust, right? And he does this by forcing us to take a look at what it is that we treasure. Jesus now explains that behind the choice between two treasures, that is where we store them up, and two visions, that is where we fix our eyes, there lies a still more basic choice between two masters. Whom are we going to serve? And really, what we are talking about today is the loves in our lives. It's about what we treasure because our hearts go with our treasure. I thought that Pastor Rick did such a good job last week demonstrating that, remember? He, he loved and treasured that plate of cookies, right? 
and it had that balloon attached to it. And now, now his heart was right there with those cookies. But when he gave the cookies to God, what happened to the heart? It went with the cookies. And now his heart was with God. That, friends, is exactly what Jesus wants for us. He wants your heart. If you want God in your lives, as we've been talking about, and if you want more and more and more of God in your life, then give him your heart. That's what he wants. So let's break these lessons down so far that we've learned about trust. But first, let's pray. Let's communicate in the kingdom of heaven. Oh, Lord, you are our teacher. Teach us today how to give our whole heart to you. Teach us about what we love and should love. Speak, O Lord, for your servants are listening. Amen. So Jesus starts his lesson by talking about our treasures, right? Our chocolate chip cookies, if you will. And he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. And here's the important part. For wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also, or also be, rather. Our hearts are with our treasure, right? And then Pastor Rick last week highlighted this this verse. He said, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is sound, then your body will be full of light. But if your eye is not sound, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And last week, Pastor Rick, he highlighted Jesus' teaching that we become blind to the wrong heart attitude towards money. And now this brings us to our climax of our passage on money that Jesus is describing to his disciples. And this is really our verse for today. No one can serve two masters for he will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other you cannot serve God and money word of the Lord praise be to God so Jesus has been teaching in this section of the Sermon on the Mount how we have or how we should have the right heart attitude about money the right perspective on our treasures how we should treasure the things of the kingdom of heaven and not the things of the kingdom of the world. How we should focus our eyes on the light of the world and not blind ourselves by the darkness of this world. And now Jesus says, we must serve God, not money. Money here is not some metaphor that Jesus is using to make a point. Jesus is talking about literal money. Turns out the people then were just as obsessed with things and wealth and money as we are today. Likewise, there was just as much a battle for their hearts as there is a battle for our hearts today. So, let's just jump right in and confront the truth of this verse. Often, people will attempt to compromise here. They will say, I can serve Jesus and make money. This is what John Stott writes. He says, those inclined, he, he's like Scottish, okay? But anyway, he says, those inclined to compromise misunderstand the teaching. They miss the picture of slave and slave owner, which lies behind these words. Now, we live in a post-slavery culture, although our country's past is always present in our collective psyche, and so we often miss or misunderstand the slave owner metaphor that is at play in this verse. But I can, sh- I can assure you that Jesus' contemporaries, they understood this metaphor fully, since many of them were slaves with Roman owners. So they understood the contextual meaning that we sometimes miss. Men and women in our world, we can work for two employers, but no slave could be the property of two owners. There was no idea of shared ownership situations for slaves. For single ownership and full-time service was the very essence of slavery. So anyone who divides his or her allegiance between God and money has already given in to money, or mammon, as Rick called it last week. And since God can be only served with entire and exclusive devotion, the whole heart, 
We must treat our money and our possessions correctly. What are you going to love? It says, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money, our passage reads in the New Living Translation. And Dallas Willard said, we cannot but serve our treasures, for they hold our hearts captive, right? We labor all day for them. We think about them all night long. They fill our dreams, but... It is not uncommon for people to think that they can treasure the world and treasure the invisible kingdom as well, that they can somehow serve both. And you know, perhaps we can make that work for a little while, but there will come a day and a time when one must be subordinate to the other. We simply cannot have two ultimate goals or or two points of reference for our actions. That's how life is, and nobody escapes that. You cannot be a servant of both God and the things on earth because their requirements, they conflict with each other at points. Unless you have already put God first, for example, what you have to do to be financially secure, to impress other people, to fulfill your own desires will invariably lead you against the wishes of God. That's why the first of the Ten Commandments, you shall love no other gods, or you shall have no other gods who take priority over me, is the first of the Ten Commandments, right? So treasuring and serving both God and mammon is a nonsensical idea. In any case, you cannot even conceive that God would endure that. Of course, you can have some material goods and value them and use them as well for the sake of God to be used in his kingdom. But that is exactly what Jesus says to do in the first place when we place our treasures in heaven. So again, do not miss or misunderstand the concept of slave and owner that is present in this verse. For Jesus is asking the question, who is your master? Again, here in our country, the idea of slavery is a foreign concept to us, but it is a common theme that runs through the Bible. So it has value for us to be able to understand it, right? What Jesus has been teaching us throughout the Sermon on the Mount is that God wants our heart. He wants to take our hearts captive. He wants our love and our devotion. That's what being a citizen in the kingdom of heaven is really all about. The Apostle Paul, he talks about this slave metaphor frequently. I have a passage here I'm going to read to you from Romans chapter 6. This is what it says. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either to sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Remember that Jesus said that we are blessed to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And do you remember their reward? For they will be satisfied. And Paul continues, he says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of the teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, he says. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to even more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves to sin, you were free in regard to righteousness, But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things to which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things was death. But now that you have been set free from sin, you have become slaves to God and the fruit that that leads to sanctification and in its end, eternal life. And then verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So in God's kingdom, we choose our master. Will we be slaves to the kingdom of the world or to the kingdom of heaven? Will we be slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness? Will will our master be money and gain or will we serve the Lord? In Galatians 1.10, Paul says, For I am now 
For am I now seeking the favor of people or of God? Or am I striving to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. So what do we make of this term bond servant? This is a term that referred to a servant or a slave that pledges his or her life to their master. It comes from an Old Testament concept and an Old Testament law. The Hebrew word for bond servant is hebed. And it allowed an indentured servant to become a bond servant voluntarily. It's talked about in Exodus chapter 21 verses 5 and 6. If a servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and I do not want to go free, then his master must take him before God. He shall then take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl, and he will be his servant forever. Do you catch what this verse is saying? We only think of slavery as bad, and we should because it's a terrible thing that Satan used to corrupt many nations. But in this case, the slave loves his master. He doesn't want to leave out of his love and devotion for his master. That love that obedience, that devotion is what motivated Paul to call himself a bondservant of God. And this act of piercing one's ear that's described in Exodus was a physical sign of bonding oneself to their master, like literally chaining yourself to the owner. In other places in the New Testament, Paul talks about the fact that we are bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the question is, who is your master? And do you love Jesus? Do you love God so much that you will bind yourselves to him? That's about the heart attitude, right? So what about our money? Jesus has tried to get our hearts in the right place about our treasures, telling us to store up our treasures in heaven, noting that where our treasure is, that is where our heart will be also essentially telling us to treasure or to, or to give our treasure, our hearts, to the things of God rather than the things of the world, the things of the kingdom of heaven. Rick last week laid out that we blind ourselves to our love for money. We are in the darkness on this issue, he said. And today, Jesus teaches us that we must choose whom we are to serve, God or Satan, Jesus or money, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of the world. So, but what about our money? How do we feel about our money? Because even if we put God first in our lives like we're supposed to do, we will still interact with money. We will still have bank accounts, 401ks, investments, the stuff that we need to live, right? So what about our money? Jesus says it's all about your heart. We give our money to God. Not a little bit of it, all of it because it's all his anyway because all that we have comes from him and in light of all of that he blesses us with what with that and what we offer him is our best and then he gives some of it back to us do you remember that from last week rick had this plate of gold bricks right and when he took the gold to god he took all of it and gave it all to god and then god gave him most of it back right now, you and I are not literally going to pile all of our money onto a plate and bring it to the church and give it to God and then hope that, that you get some of that back. That's not how this works, right? But we have this conversation with God to decide how much he is asking us to trust with him and how much he will then trust you with. Last week, Rick challenged us to begin with at least 10%. And he said, if you're not giving 10%, then to prayerfully consider how you might increase that incrementally in order to get to that 10%. Now, some of us see this as obedience, and others see this as giving their hearts to God. And I can 100% tell you that God wants your heart in your obedience. Let me give you an example. There were these two guys, right? They were brothers. Both of them were hard workers. Both of them were successful. In time, each of them brought their offering to church and they gave it to God. And one of the brothers really loved God with all of his heart. And he gave his offering cheerfully and grac graciously. And out of his heart, he gave the very best part of what he had to give. 
The other brother came in, and he also brought an offering to the Lord, and he gave out of dutiful obedience. He had worked just as hard as his brother, and he brought his offering to the Lord, but the Lord rejected his offering because his heart really wasn't in it. We all know this is the story of Cain and Abel, right? And the result of the wrong heart attitude about his offering was that Cain murdered his brother Abel. Paul knows this story very well, and he advises his young protege, Timothy. He says this, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And some people, craving money, have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. So the love of money, the wrong heart about offering, led to all kinds of evil in Cain, and it led to the death of Abel. There's a reason that shortly after we read about the sin in the Garden of Eden, the next story we read is the first murder, especially since the heart of that story is a messed up heart about money. Abel's offering was favored by the Lord, and it produced in Cain a response of jealousy. How about your offering? Be honest with yourselves. Do you dread the moment in the service when the plate is passed around? If your heart is right, then we should truly look forward to that part of the service. That's worship, folks. To bring our offering before the Lord. This is an active part of the service. We are giving back to God. In our service, we begin with praise, right? We sing songs of adoration to the Lord to the Father, to the creator of the universe. And then we continue our worship by giving up to the Father our offering. It is the acknowledgement that all that we have comes from him and getting our whole heart in on this action. That time of offering, that's a sacred time between you and God. And thankfulness and joy should characterize your emotional response to this part of the service. And then, then you receive, you receive the message, the word, through the reading of scripture and the message that's proclaimed up here. Offering praise, offering ad- adoration, offering the fruits of our labors, and then receiving his word and message, receiving his blessing at the end, the benediction. That's what's going on in here. That's what we do on Sundays. Sometimes we hold back our offering from the church. We do this when we're worried about our own finances, right? And maybe that's an indication that we're losing trust in God. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week. But sometimes we hold our offering back when we disagree with some things that are happening in the church. We're upset with leadership or you're upset with the pastor. Now, let me ask you this. How can you maintain the right heart attitude with your treasure and with your money if you're holding back your offering because you're unhappy with the church? You can't, right? While the church uses the money that we collect to carry on the ministries of the church, paying our bills, paying our staff, and all of that, what's really happening is a spiritual thing here. You are offering a portion of your labor. You give it to God because When we do, we give our hearts to God. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I I want you to ask yourself three questions. Do I love God? Do I trust God? And am I giving God my heart when I give my offering? And so now I want to tell you about our situation. I'm going to get very real with you here this morning. We are not doing well financially as a church. Now, I did not plan this series as a big campaign to come and ask for a big gift, okay? Or to prime you up for a big giving pitch. We've been using the Sermon on the Mount, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we've been allowing that to direct the things that we're talking about. And so our text on the Sermon on the Mount has been leading up to this point, and it just happens to be right now. And so really, it's God's will that we're talking about money during this time because that's the part of the Sermon on the Mount that we're in. So let me give you the situation. 
Giving so far for 2022 is very low. Now this is the graphic that was included in our weekly email that was reported, that reports our February financial information. I want you to, I want to point out a couple of things to you on this report. I'm very nervous about this. I don't like talking about this stuff, but here we go. February's income, and hopefully you can see it, was $22,369. Last February, during the pandemic, it was $36,900. Year to date for this year, as of February, is $52,743. Last year at this time, we were looking at $80,799. Now I can tell you that January's numbers and March's numbers will be pretty much the same. In terms of income, um, income is comprised here really of two things. The offering plate and our facilities income. Now we also have our expenses report. Right now we're spending at or close to our budget each month. Which means that with incoming, income coming in so, so low, we cannot sustain our current budget. Nor can we keep our, cons our current expenses at the current level. So you might be thinking, those of you who have business minds out there, you might be thinking, no problem. Let's just cut spending and we'll be fine. I just want everybody to understand that means that we will probably need to reduce staff because that's where we are. So ask yourself those three questions that I just mentioned. Do I love God? Do I trust God? And am I giving God my heart when I give my offering? Seek his will for you. Maybe he's asking you to give more money to our ministry here. Maybe he's asking you to go out and invite people to come to our church so that it will grow. I'm not standing here today to guilt you into giving more money. That is not my purpose. I'm not up here also to sow any kind of seeds of discouragement. On the contrary, I believe that God is doing a great work here at Lighthouse. And I believe that God is going to do a miraculous work in our city because we're Lighthouse. We are a family shining Christ's light into our community. That is our mission. And God is totally in that mission and I am excited to see what's gonna happen. So if you feel God moving in your heart today to make a change in your offering that you bring to God, then do so with thankfulness and joy. If you're unhappy with things in the church, talk to us. Talk to us. We can't change it if we don't know it's upsetting you. Okay? Do you love God? Do you trust God? And are you giving God your heart when you give your offering? Because this is about our hearts, right? This is about whom we are going to serve. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank, we thank you, Lord, that through your divine will, you plan out the sermon schedule. And we thank you, Lord, that we can have the courage to stand here and to talk openly about how we feel about money, which is such a personal thing. But Lord, it has a way of just capturing our heart. It has a way of preventing us from giving ourselves fully to you. But when we decide and dedicate ourselves to you and give that part of our lives over to you, wow, Lord, you do a work in us that is exciting. You do a work in us that changes us forever. You do a work in us, Lord, that leads to life, eternal life. Because it's about what's keeping us from you. And sometimes what's keeping us from you is the thing that we conceive that we control. And when we let go of that control, we put our trust in you because you are trustworthy and because in you 
we place our hope. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.